exergy. <laughs> and last time we talked about the property, exergy. This time we'll get the balance equation for a closed system. It's like the first law, which was an energy balance equation for a closed system. We also had a entropy, a second law of thermodynamics, which is an entropy balance for uh, a closed system. Well, we're going to get an exergy balance. So it'll look a lot like the first as well as the second law, but it's really not the third law. It's just an exergy balance equation. Okay. Uh, then we will try to get to flow exergy, and then we will try to get to an exergy balance equation for an open system where you have mass transfer and addition. That's the difference. So, your homework right now. No notes, no looking at an equation sheet, no looking at a textbook. From memory, from memory, I ask you to write on a sheet of paper, I'm going to walk around, the, an energy balance equation for a closed system that undergoes a process from initial state one to final state two. When I get three correct answers, I'll move on. From memory, no equation sheet, no anything else. Professor, is that the first law of thermodynamics? And is that another way of saying, you know, energy balance equation? Yes, exactly. That's what I'm looking for. You get, it's like. So anyway, uh, a lot of people wrote something like this. The final energy, the total final energy in the system at the end of the process is going to be larger than the total energy at the beginning of the process. That's really a change in the energy of the system. How does the, change, how does the energy of the system change? How did it maybe go up? Well, you could have had a heat transfer bringing in some energy during the process, or because we want the work to be out, we put a negative on the workout. So that's why there's a negative sign. Our <laughs> sign convention is Q in workout. So a lot of people wrote that. A lot of people wrote this. A lot of people wrote change in U plus the change in KE plus the change in PE is equal to Q1 to 2 minus W1 to 2. A lot of people wrote M, then the change in U2 minus U1 plus 1 half V2 squared minus 1 half, eh, 1 half V1 squared plus GZ2 minus GZ1 equal to Q1 to 2 minus W1 to 2. Is there another form that I would have been happy to see? Any of those look good, right? Is that what we're talking about? So, here it is. Next part, part B. All right. From memory, for a closed system that undergoes a process from initial state one to final state two, write an entropy balance equation. Professor, is that another way of saying the second law of thermodynamics? Yep. So not only can we write the equation, but we can talk as we write it. So the final entropy at the end of the process minus the initial entropy. So that's a change in the entropy. It can go up, it can go down, or it could stay the same. If it's delta S is equal to zero, if there's no change in entropy, what do we call that type of process? Isothermal process. No. Adiabatic process. No. Isentropic process. Exactly. If the change in entropy is equal to zero, it's called an isentropic process. So that's equal to how can the entropy go up? It's a closed system, so there's no mass transfer. Only heat transfer. And so if I have a little bit of heat transfer coming in, you divide by the boundary temperature at which it comes in, and that's a little bit of entropy coming in, and I integrate over all of the heat transfers coming in. So I may integrate from 1 to 2. The limits on the integral are optional. We know what we're talking about. You're integrating 
summing up all of the heat transfers as it's coming into the system, and that boundary temperature could change during the process. Sometimes they'll write that like this, Q1 to 2 divided by TB. Hey, where's the integral? Well, what do you assume about TB? How does it change during the process? It's not changing. If it's a ba constant boundary temperature, it simplifies that integral. All right. But in general, that's the way we'd write it. Plus, how can entropy go up? What's that symbol for? Entropy production. Entropy can be produced because of the presence of friction, because of the irreversibilities. And sometimes we put one to two on that, sometimes not. Okay? So there you go. I'll leave it at that. That's a good second law. That's entropy balance uh, for a process, closed system. So <clears throat> write the exergy. See the pattern? Energy, entropy, now exergy balance equation. Professor, uh, we haven't covered that yet. Good point. Let's derive it. Let's derive it, okay? So what do you do when you want to derive the exergy balance equation for a closed system? Well, you start with the same type of system that we did when we derived the property entropy, exergy. Huh, I get tongue twisted here. For the property exergy, you start with a system with its environment, and you're really interested in the useful work coming out. And that system can push back or be pushed on by the environment, but I'm showing it here as pushing into the environment. Is that useful work? No. That's a boundary work from the pr perspective of the system, but that's just pushing back the environment. That's not useful. That's not going to be work that can be used to lift something or turn something. This is what we're really interested in when we're talking about exergy. Okay. So we start and we write the first law of thermodynamics for the system only. Can you see that this is a good expression of the first law of thermodynamics for the system only? And then what we try to do is we try to separate out this work into two parts. One is the useful work, and the other is this pushing back the environment, which is the not useful component of the work. Now we're done with the first law. We go to the second law of thermodynamics for the system only. Does that look like the traditional second law for the system only? Now here's a little algebra. You take and multiply the second law by T naught. So you get delta T, whoops, yeah. Delta S times T naught equal to the integral put T naught you can bring it because it's a constant inside that integral delta, uh, come on now, come on, del Q from 1 to 2 plus T naught sigma. Did I multiply the whole equation by T naught? Then what you do is you subtract it, put a minus sign, minus sign, minus sign, from the first law. And the algebra brings the Delta, there I'll change color, delta U from here, delta KE, delta PE, and then you're going to have a minus T naught delta S, see that, equal to, now you'll have this term. Well, this term is 1, integral 1 dQ, and you're going to subtract the integral T naught over TB. You can combine them to 1 minus T naught over TB, see that, del Q. So that term and that term combined to this term. And then we're going to have that work both as useful as well as non-useful. And the last is minus T naught sigma. Algebra, right? What do we do with this P naught delta B? Throw it to the other side. Ready to move to the next page? You're done with the derivation, essentially. It's name calling now. Because when you look at it, everything that was over here is simply the change in the exergy of the system. That's all it is. And then what we have is this term right here. We say, oh, that must be a transfer of exergy for the system due to heat transfer. Just like entropy transferred with heat, we must have exergy transferring with heat. Sure enough. And there's this coefficient, 1 minus T naught over TB. What is T naught? Is it the same as TB? No. It's the dead state temperature, and then it's the boundary temperature at which the heat is transferred. So the two temperatures are distinct. Then we have the 
exergy transfer with the work. That's the useful, the useful work. And then we have the exergy destruction. It's kind of a taking it away. Entropy produced, there was a plus sign to add it to the entropy balance in front of the sigma. But when we do the exergy balance, there's a negative indicating that it's being destroyed. The ability to do useful work is being destroyed somehow due to irreversibilities. And it's name calling. And so this is the term for transfer of exergy with heat. This is the term for the transfer with work. Notice that you have both useful and not useful. We put that non-useful term out of it. Okay, we only want the useful term. We only want the useful component of it. Okay, and uh, this is the exergy destruction. Look how simple the exergy destruction is. If you have entropy generation, you have exergy destruction. And it's a nice simple equation. It's, you know, T naught, the dead state temperature in Kelvin, absolute scale, times sigma, the amount of entropy produced in the process. So there is the summary of what we call the exergy balance equation. Now, I forgot to mention that I looked closely at our textbook. E is italicized throughout the entire textbook. Cap E, slightly italicized, lowercase e, italicized, guess what? I can't tell it when I write it, but it is in the textbook italicized for energy. To distinguish E and E, this E and that E from that E and that E, there's no italics on the exergy. But I can't write cleanly enough to make that distinction, okay? But in our textbook, if you really look at it, you can tell the difference between non italicized exergy and italicized energy. All right, so there it is. There's our exergy balance for a closed system, no mass transfer, undergoing a process from initial state one to final state two. Solve a problem. A rigid, well-insulated tank contains so much kilograms of steam, so 6.43 kilograms of steam. It's at 0.7 bar and 200 degrees C. So in our mind, we're making a little sketch and we know the pressure in this, pressure, initial pressure, and the initial temperature, and it's well insulated, maybe we do something like that, and it's rigid. So this means something, this means something, right? Let's see if we have a sense of it. If we could stick our hand into that steam, what do you think would happen to our hand? 200 degrees C, what do you think? It would hurt, <laughs> it'd burn, true? All right, now the other experiment I like to play is let's say I take a pick or some device to pop a hole, a drill, and I pop a hole in that tank. What's inside? Steam, H2O. What's outside? Air. Don't shout it out. I want you to write on your sheet of paper whether or not the air rushes in or the steam rushes out. I got time to think. I gotta solve this problem. Then I gotta move on and do something else. No. So, uh, what about this P1 of 0.7 bar? What's the air pressure out here? One bar. All right. Where, when you got a hole, which way does it rush? From low pressure to high or high to low? Flow goes from high to low, so air is rushing in when you pop a hole in this one, right? All right. Let's move on. Paddle wheel stirs the steam until the pressure is one bar. So here's my paddle wheel, imaginary paddle wheel coming in or drawing it, and it's going like that. It's just turning up the steam. Well, first of all, that's got to be a made-up problem. There's no way. Paddle wheel, to increase the pressure, isn't this an increase in pressure to go from 0.7 to 1 bar? The paddle wheel can't do that. I need a piston sliding in a cylinder to increase the pressure. Can, can this happen physically? Yeah, it can. How? What's the paddle wheel going to do to make it pressure go up? Transfer a lot of energy in. That's going to increase the temperature. And because of increase in temperature, it wants to expand. It's not going to be able to expand. The pressure is going to go up. All right. Ignore the effects of motion and gravity and determine 
So basically, the neglect kinetic energy changes and potential energy changes of the steam during the process. That's, what the, that's the way the book phrases this type of problem. Determine the final temperature. What are they asking me to solve for in the symbol? Oh, let's pick T for temperature. And in subscript to that symbol, final temperature, T2. How am I going to find T2? What's the strategy? I want it in words before we start working in equations. Who's going to give it to me out loud? Strategy. Okay, your last chance, or your last for today. You get one, and then i got to get others to participate because you're too eager. <laughs> you find the specific volume of the superheated steam at state one. It stays the same to state two, and then you find where it matches that at the new pressure. Okay. That's, you're, you're about three steps ahead of me, but you're absolutely right. All I want at this point is I'm going to say, I'm going to apply the first law of thermodynamics. Let, let's, let's always start with the basics, all right? All right. But when we apply the first law of thermodynamics for the process, what do we have? A chain, let's do this. We have the, the mass times the final internal energy, initial internal energy, equal to neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy, <coughs> equal to the amount of heat transfer coming in during the process, minus the work out during the process. True or false? True, but we also have no heat transfer because it's insulated. insulated. That's right. It's well insulated. So now we think about this for a minute, and they tell us some property information. So let's list our property information. We know the mass initial and the mass final. I know this is a trivial statement because it's a closed system. Did the mass change in the tank? No, it has to be the same. It's 6.43 kilograms and 6.43 kilograms. But they did tell us property 1, pressure 1, pressure 2. It starts at 0.7 bar. It ends at 1 bar. Let's go to T1 and T2. They give us that it starts at 200 degrees C. But before we struggle with it, just start listing your properties. P1, T1, V1, U1, H1, S1, E X or G1. You have V2, U2, H2, S2, E2, right? And what do we want to do is we want to say these two pieces of information, those two <coughs> independent properties, because you verify that the steam is in the superheated region in the tables, and you can look up the other properties at that state, right? You can read off V1. You can read off U1, H1, S1, E1, they could have tabulated, but you can calculate it with a little bit of work. But conceptually, it's the extra G initial state one. Flush that out for me a little bit, Professor. I come over here to the superheated table A4. I find the 0.7 bar. I come down to what temperature did we say it was? 200. And is this the value of B1? Is this the value of U1? H1 and S1, exactly right. All right. So now I know these values. All right. I look and I find that it's a rigid tank. Because it's rigid, what's the relationship between V1 and V2? They're equal. This is equal to the same value. Now I look and I'm using the state principle. V is known, or I deduced it. And P is known, or I did do as well, it was given in the problem statement. Can I determine the other properties from those two pieces of information? And now, how would I determine it? Go and look at this pressure of one bar and see if it's, they give me a pressure table of one bar. And they do, right there is the one bar pressure table. And this was V1. Whoops, this is V1 right here. Let's see if we can find where V ha V2 has the same value. Where is that? Right down right in here. It's between 400, a little over 400. Well, I picked this problem. I made this problem up. So when you see a number match that good, look at 3.108 versus 3.103. 
do you want to do any more interpolation? Go for it, but let's move on, right? <laughs> right? I agree. Let's move on. So basically, right here is V2. Right there is U2. Right there is H2, if you need it. I don't think you need it for this problem. And there's S2. And right here is T2. Do you see how we determine T2? So I guess we really didn't need to use the first law after all. All we needed to use was the state principle in fixing states. Now we'll need it for the work transfer. For part B, what is the work transfer? Well, can you see from the first law right here that the work 1 to 2 is equal to the minus mass U2 minus U1. And we just got V1 and V2s and all the T2s and all those properties. So we just go to the table and we get U2 and we get U1. Remember, come over here. This is U2 right here. And this is right here, U1, isn't it? Isn't that it? Then we go back and we can make that calculation. Oh, by the way, the answer for the temperature for part A is 400. It's negative. Work 1 to 2 is negative 2,000. What are the units on this? Well, what are the units on mass? Kilogram. How about U? Kilojoules per kilogram. So it's kilojoule. That's the answer for part B. This is the answer for part A. Part C, change in exergy. Change in exergy, part C. Well, exergy, sometimes it's just, you just think of it, oh, it's a property. It's another property. Down here was E1, theoretically I can get it, and E2 right there. So if I would like to get E2 minus E1, isn't that a change in exergy? It's the mass times lowercase specific E2 minus lowercase, you know, specific E1. Let's flush out what the E1 is and the E2. So it's U2 minus U0 plus P0 V2 minus V0 minus T0 times S2 minus S0. I'm dropping the kinetic potential because they told us it's negligible. Minus, and now the the E2, which is, I mean, sorry, the E1, U1 minus U0 plus P0, V1 minus V0, minus T0, S1 minus S0. Close parent. That's where we open it. That's where we close it. And I guess I have to put uh, this parenthesis and that parenthesis. So there's a couple parentheses. That minus sign applies to all those terms, right? All right, now, guess what happens, thankfully, to the u naughts? They go away. They cancel. <laughs> and the p naught v naughts go away, too. And the t naught s naughts go away. And so the simplification, you get m times u2 minus u1 plus p naught times v2 minus v1 minus t naught times s2 minus s1. Uh, be careful there. Uh, you could have some entropy transfer with heat. In this case, if there's an, that's right, then in this case, that S2 minus S1 from the second law is sigma, the entropy production. Yes? Uh, because I should have even spent more time on it. It's, it's, uh, it's equal to M times E2 minus E1. And that E2, I tried to write all right here, then minus E1, all right there. And then you see that, oh, U0 is in both of them, and they cancel there. That's how they cancel. So it's like these two canceled, those canceled as part of the P0 times that, and then these canceled as part of the T0 times that. Yes? If you would have interpreted the power rule to be like putting a heat and digital control volume around it, would that have changed the problem? Yes. The yes, it would. S1 Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah, um, there are many variations. And as soon as you start changing from work to heat, the heat is bringing with it exergy um, and entropy as well as energy. 
the shaft work with the paddle wheel brings with energy, no entropy. Exergy, 100%. It, whatever is the transfer because of the work, the work is pure work. You know, it's organized energy transfer. That's uh, If it was 50 kilojoules of uh, energy transfer in the shaft, it's 50 kilojoules, the same magnitude of exergy transfer. It's all useful work. Yep, because it's all useful work. Shaft work is pure, great work. We love shaft work. All right, so I take the two numbers for U, the two numbers for V, the two numbers for S. I use the P naught, I use the T naught. Two things about T naught. Well, T naught has to be absolute. Even though they gave it to us as a 20 degrees C, don't put 20 in there. You need to put 20 plus 273. It needs to be Kelvin. All right, and then uh, you can compute the change in the exergy is 970 kilojoules. That's the change in the exergy. That's the answer to part uh, C. It's an increase of exergy. Part D, what is the exergy transfer with the work? Well, what was the work transfer? It was negative 2,000 out, so it really was 2,000 kilojoules in. What is the exergy transfer with that work? It's exactly what we were just talking about. It's, 2, it's negative 2,000 kilojoules. So the exergy transfer with the work, negative 2,000 kilojoules. What does the negative sign imply? It's out. I'm sorry. It's not out of the system, but it's actually into the system. It's in the. You know, we want the exergy transfer with the work to be the same direction as the, en the energy transfer with the work. So, energy out of the shaft, you know, out of the control volume in the shaft, that would be positive, but it's in, so it's negative for this problem. All right. How about part? This is D. How about part E? What is the exergy destruction? There's two ways to calculate it. The easiest is to go back and say, exergy destruction, it's T naught times the entropy production. And how do I calculate the entropy second law for the process? And just like you did in your head, you said, hey, I think I know what that second law gives us. When you do the second law, let me write it out. It's a S, let me do this one. Uh, cap S2 minus cap S1 is equal to the integral del cap Q over TB uh, plus the sigma 1 to 2, but it's adiabatic. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's no heat transfer. It's well insulated. Okay, so that's zero. And so this turns out to be uh, T naught times the mass times lowercase s2 minus lowercase s1. I don't know why I have a parenthesis there. Get rid of that parenthesis there. Good. And when you do the math, not to switch over pages, this uh, exergy destruction term comes in at 1030 kilojoules. That's the second way. The second way, which I'm going to just go back to our exergy balance equation, is we could say right here, we already calculated what was the change in the exergy of the system. Let me jump back here. It was 970 nine, oh, kilojoules. How much exergy was transferred with the heat? It's well insulated, zero. And what was that useful work? It was, you remember this nine assign, it was negative 2,000 kilojoules because shaft work is by definition useful work. It's 100%. Of the, and so this is minus the exergy destruction. So you can calculate the exergy destruction from the exergy balance equation, which gives us that the exergy destruction is equal to 2,000 minus 970 kilojoules, it's 1030 kilojoules. Basically, I didn't have to go and use S's again to get sigma. I basically just went back and said, I already calculated this, I already calculated that, boom, I can get the exergy destruction from an exergy balance. 
both ways make sense? So there's like no non-useful work in this problem? No, what you've done is you've destroyed the ability to do work. That paddle wheel is very irre irreversible, a lot of friction, right? And so there was a destruction of 10, 30 kilojoules of useful work. It came in nice, pure work. It was destroyed. What's left? Uh, 970 kilojoules. If you're the most clever engineer, you have a shot at getting the 970 back. It's like going to the bank and saying, here's some money. Here is a 2,000 kilo, whatever, number of pounds or let's say dollars. And the bank comes back and says, uh, sorry, we had a little destruction going on. There was a paddle wheel working in our vault last night. And uh, 1,030 of your dollars is gone. And now the best you can hope for, please, I want my withdrawal now. The best you can hope for is 970. Start being a clever engineer and try and figure out how you're going to get hot steam that's at that pressure and temperature in a rigid container to undergo some theoretical process to give you useful shaft work out with uh, 970 kilojoules. It was destroyed though because that work was basically heat transfer. No, well, it's internal. It converted in internal energy, friction. Go look at the sources of irreversibility. It's friction. It's beating it up. All right. So last time we emphasized the property exergy. It's a property. And we think of other properties. We think of, oh, energy, internal energy, enthalpy. And we think of the properties that were useful for closed system energy balance and open system energy balance. That was all good. Remember that this really is, this book doesn't make a big deal of any flow energy. It just says enthalpy plus one half V squared plus GZ. But we then went to this other property, exergy, and we got exergy. And then we have the idea of flow exergy useful for an open system. Did we derive this yet? No. But we know we're going to go that direction. And if you see that parallel, you see the like similarity with energy, it makes it a lot easier. Well, here's our exergy rate balance equation for a control volume. What's the difference between a closed system and an open system? Closed, no mass transfer. Open, you have a control volume allowing mass to flow across the boundaries of the control volume for an open system. So here's our equation. First of all, what is this term over here? Shouldn't we have a rate of change of exergy in the control volume with respect to time? Yep. But we really, in this whole chapter, this whole text, never solve a transient exergy problem. They're all steady state. So one of the challenges with thermodynamics, we have all these great glorious equations, and then, oh, this term's 99.999% crossed out, and it's equal to zero. Well, here, let's just cross it out. It's zero. So start, put the zero is equal to. And now, what, what, how do you read this? This is a rate of heat transfer, and when it's coming in, it's bringing with it exergy. That coefficient that multiplies it is 1 minus T naught over TV or TJ of that boundary, at whatever it's coming across. Why do you have a summation? Well, it could be coming in one side, going out the other, coming in two sides, going out three sides. You can make it more complex. What is this? That's, think of that as shaft power going out of that control volume. It could be coming in. It could be electric power as well because electric power is 100%, you know, exergy with that power the same. But just think of it as shaft power out of that control volume, just like we had for the, um, um, the, the first law of conservation of energy. Here's our mass flow rate, but what's it bringing? The flow exergy, which is H minus H naught minus T naught S minus S naught plus one half V squared plus GZ, isn't it? That's our flow exergy. And then what is this? Oh, it's going exiting, it's out. Why do we have a summation sign? Oh, we want it so complex we get two inlets or three inlets or five inlets. And what is the summation? Oh, you have two outlets, three outlets, five outlets, whatever you want. What about this term? 
it's an exergy destruction, so we have a negative in front of that exergy destruction, and it's due to irreversibilities. That's the only thing it's due to. And that exergy destruction is equal to the dead state temperature times sigma dot, the entropy production. All right, that's a simple equation. Here's your flow exergy term. Uh, did you just derive? No, nope, didn't derive it. Maybe we'll do it next time. But here is the pattern. You have balance equations. You have a mass balance equation. Okay? If it's a closed system, what's the mass balance equation? This is the simplest equation on the page. It says the mass that's in the closed system at the final state minus the mass in the closed system at the initial state, that change in mass is zero. <laughs> right? That's a simple, guess what, if you go this direction in this table, guess what, that's the most complicated equation. But hopefully you see, I have four big equations for closed systems. Mass, what's this one right here? Energy, this one. Entropy, this one. Exergy, all for a closed system. In any of those closed system equations, is there an m dot? Can you find an m dot? All right. Now let's go to an open system analysis using a control volume. What is this equation? Conservation of mass. Did you get exposed to that in thermal one? Absolutely. And what is this equation? Energy. And this equation? Entropy, and this equation, exergy. So on this page, which equations are new? This one, and this is new too. What are your old friends? The other six. But to master the problems in Chapter 7 with exergy, often you must be able to solve problems using the principles straight out of Thermo 1. Got it? So we'll go ahead and stop there for today. Thank you for your attention.